Live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE. Covering Oracle Open World 2016. Brought to you by Oracle. Now, here's your host, John Furrier and Peter Burris. Hey, welcome back everyone. We are here live at Oracle Open World in San Francisco on the ground floor of Oracle Open World 2016. This is theCUBE, Silicon Angle's flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier with my co-host Peter Burris. Our next guest is Sharon Weinbar, who is a fabulous person, top-notch VC, but no, now the CEO of Hackbright Academy, still involved with Scale VP. Great to see you, good Thanks, friend. Ben. Been a while. Number one in rowing. Tell us about your rowing status. I want to get that out <laughs> first because it's super so, impressive. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm a master's rower. I'll be rowing ahead of the Charles next week. And right now on the Concept2, that's the uh, rowing machine manufacturer, uh, global uh, rankings, I'm number one in my age class for 5K. That's awesome, congratulations. Well, you've been an amazing investor, been following your venture capital career for over 10 years. Uh, at Scale VP, you've done some amazing investments. But you, you, you took a step out of the, the, the meat grinder of the venture capital world as a leader of the firm, although you're still involved, to get involved with uh, Hackbright and its mission, which is then got sold to a public company, fully funded and scaling up, pun intended, Scale VP. But what, what motivated you to leave the um, the, the, the ivory tower, the VC world, to get down and dirty. Down with and dirty in a, boot, in a yeah. bootstrap startup, uh, mission-driven startup. So there were a couple things that came together kind of all, all at once. Uh, big picture was, I was on the verge of being an empty nester when I first met Hackbright, which I'll tell you about in a second. And so I sort of started the year before my daughter, my youngest daughter left for college thinking, embrace change. I, I was afraid of being an empty nester and I, wanted to lean in to, to thinking about doing something different. I had been a partner at Scale VP for 14 years. I started as a venture capitalist when my kids started school because I wanted to be more in control of my schedule and not have as much international business travel as I had. So I had an open mind. And then I was researching women in engineering for a big article I wrote for TechCrunch about how to hire women engineers. And I looked into how many women engineers were being graduated in traditional computer science programs in, in colleges. And the numbers, the percentages are increasing, but the actual absolute number is vanishingly small. So top 20 computer science programs, graduated 500 women in computer science. So if Google hired all of them, it would change their ratio by one and a half percentage points. The whole rest of the industry would yeah. get scratched. Yeah. And I wasn't- A blip on the radar, basically. It's a rounding right. error for the right. stats. I wasn't willing to buy into, it's a pipeline problem, right? That's what a lot of men suppose. There just aren't women who are interested in. So I went looking for alternative sources of high quality engineering candidates. I reached out to Hackbright on Twitter. They invited me to come in for a coffee meeting. It was supposed to be a half an hour. And I spent three hours with the founder, who was a young fellow. Um, and we just had a mind melt, and I fell in love with the concept. As an investor, I'd had thousands and thousands of meetings with startups. Occasionally, every couple of, you know, a couple of times a year, I'd have a meeting with a startup and walk out of the meeting and think, I want, to, I want to invest in that company. I want to be involved with this company, but be involved like chicken, right? Yeah. I walked out of that first meeting with Hackbright and thought, I want to be involved like the pig. I want to be committed here. I want to work here. And it was a really weird feeling because in all those years of venture capital, I never thought, oh, I want to actually go back to being a line manager. Uh, so I called the founder, David, that night and said, I just want to be part of this. Um, and what Hackbride does is teach um, early and mid-career professional women computer science fundamentals and professional software development skills and get her ready for a new career as a software engineer. So she has a bachelor's degree, 20% of our students have advanced degrees, she's got work experience, but somehow in the great sorting hat of life, she ended up in the wrong spot, in a job that wasn't intellectually challenging, she didn't, uh, and she's decided she wants to move into being a software engineer, so we help her make that pivot. Um, so this isn't getting down into the trenches on age, generational, like lower no, in no, the, in this the is, age. This is converting working women into, open, you know, into software engineers and helping her get jobs in open recs. There's the conference board just published stats. There are 535,000 open positions in software engineering right now. I mean, 
when you think about and we got a stat from on the Cube interview last week that 1.4 million uh, open uh, under funded jobs available for security yeah. engineering, right. computer science, data analytics and whatnot. 1.4 right. million open positions. Right, so that's so when you think of, so this is the, um, Hackbright spoke both to my heart because of the mission, but also to my head as a venture capitalist because the market opportunity, the big social mission is actually part of a big market opportunity um, that gave the company a lot of room to scale. And that's that's where I felt comfortable coming in and helping the company scale up. So when you think about that, you know, that quote from Mark Andrews, software is eating the world, what that means is every company has to become a software company. So it's not just uh, venture-funded startups here in Silicon Valley or big software companies like Oracle that are hiring software engineers. Every retailer of financial services, travel company, has already become a software company, right? Because you're doing everything on your phone. I just joined the board of a large diversified industrial manufacturer on the East Coast called Colfax Corporation. It's a public $4 billion company. They asked me to join the board because they wanted a Silicon Valley digital native to help them think through their software strategy, even though you know, they're, we're the world's market leader in welding. So they want to do the digital transformation, right. digitize right. their business. Right. Right. <laughs> so that's what's driving this requirement for so many software engineers across a lot of different disciplines. Is there a makeup um, for the women that are in transition here? Because it does, I like that sorting hat now, because that's, I mean, I can, I can see that. People end up, I mean, who would have thought I'd be hosting the queue? I have a computer science degree. I love love this job. Um, but it just happens, people get end up in a spot. You become what you're known for, and sometimes you get right. stuck, and it's hard to move. Is that is it a migration? Is it a sh issue? Is it the, more, what, the, what are some there's of the- so many um, there are so many different ways that people end up in jobs that don't float their boat for some reason, right? You um, either you don't know that computer science exists as a discipline, um, someone in your universe told you it wasn't for you. Uh, we have a woman, a young woman who works for us right now who grew up on the Arizona-Mexico border. In her high school, she had to fight to even go to college because the high school counselor told her, oh no, you don't go to college, you get married and have babies, right, when she was 17 <laughs> in America. Yeah. So, uh, so she had to fight even to go to college, and then she has a liberal arts degree, worked as a counselor, but has a significant other who was an engineer, and she got exposed to engineering through, software engineering through him. And what a lot of our students say, uh, have the experience is they, they have a friend, significant other, sibling. So it's an exposure an issue mainly too, often, right? Kind of get the often, bug, kind of. Right. And, and they think, they see that and think, I could do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and our women tend to be makers. So, so you know, there, it takes a special set of attributes, not just educational background, to be an engineer. Um, you want to have to build things. So our students are often makers. They, they're cooks, they build things, they make their own honey, they make their own makeup, they have, you know, they, they have created Innate energy. ability, you can see the natural, right. natural ability. Right, and they, well, they have a vision for how something should be, and they can find the path to that. Okay, let's take, how does it work? Okay, so just take us through the process. I want to make sure people can understand this. Uh, is there a filter? Is there an application? Yep. How does it work? Do they do it remote? Sure. Also, the internet is an enabler for you? Um, sure, possibly. I'll talk about all of that. Take so, us through um, the workflow. So, uh, so first of all, we're based here in San Francisco right now. We have a campus here in downtown San Francisco. About 20% of our students come from outside the Bay Area and they apply and uh, get in and come. And the majority of our students are from this region. Um, and they commute, a, in, they commute in, or is it? A, uh, the students who are coming from all over the country are living in Airbnb, hacker <laughs> hostels, Craigslist. So they're roughing you know, it. They're, yes, yeah. So or get an apartment. We have, yeah, it's a scrappy group of people. Uh, you know, they're, they're willing to quit their job, pay a nearly $17,000 tuition, invest in themselves to transition their career. We have a competitive application process, so uh, you have to um, fill out a form, write an essay. In the essay, we're looking for, can you think like an engineer? Can you describe something, the big picture, break it down into its component elements, and tell us how they work together? It can be any topic, but like that's Almost like a whiteboard for. session, yep. like, you know, code that or something, there's get a, a feel for yep, it. There's an interview, 
where we're looking for a combination of grit, so will you be able to stick with it, and can you work in teams, right? Uh, because you hear our business model really requires our, our graduates to go on and be successfully placed as software engineers. And there's a code challenge. So we're looking for people to come in who have done some self-study, either online with Code Academy or Coursera, or they've taken a community college class, they've you know gone worked their way through a couple books. So they do a code challenge as part of the interview. So we're not teaching them what is shell script, yeah. you know, what is what is a procedure. Some um, base basic fundamentals right. Right. and familiarity. So so after that uh, application process, we select a cohort, we teach on a calendar quarter system, it's 12 weeks, intensive, full-time, immersive, on-site at Hackbright, 683 Sutter Street in San Francisco. So, um, every day, class is a mixture of lecture and lab, so there's a lecture for an hour or an hour and a half, it's followed up immediately by hands-on lab work, and all of the lab work is pair programming, so two women sitting side by side, talking about their code design, talking about how they decided to structure it that way, why did they pick this data structure. Mm -hmm. um, all of that pair programming is meant both to reinforce the learning, so as you have to you know, describe to somebody why you did somebody something and explain it, it reinforces your own learning, but it also trains you to be an engineer. In the real world, you have to talk about your code to your colleagues. And women tend to be shy and introverted not in, in, in putting themselves out there in the workplace. I'm not making generalizations about women's personalities in general. So we, but you've taken from, that discipline of communication correct. with the coding, not making it a separate siloed course. Right, exactly. So from the first day, you're talking about code. We want you to be really comfortable being an engineer talking about code. So, so that's the structure of the program is lecture lab, lecture lab. The contents are a mix of computer science fundamentals, so data structures and algorithms, the same kind of information you'd be getting at Cal or Stanford or any other top CS program. But then a mixture of also professional software development skills. So what does it mean to work in an agile methodology? How do you design and test? Uh, what does it mean to build a distributed application? So a lot of computer science programs teach a very structured and traditional format of computer science, and they don't teach you APIs from Twilio and deployment on AWS. And our students are gonna learn all of that in the program. Um, four weeks toward the end are dedicated toward, to building a project. So each student builds her own full stack web application. Uh, from ideation to specification to MVP so the build to out. working code. The build. It's deployed That's on the thesis. That's like your big project. You are, are hands-on <laughs> building code, deploying it on GitHub. So then when you go to apply for a job, uh, the engineering manager can see your code, can walk through and, your do resume. and do a code review with you, and you've practiced talking about code. Um, so, and that's unlike most of the other code schools that have either a group project or a refactoring of an existing website. Really, we really want women to own the decision about the architecture of her application and all of the implementation. And then, um, the other big differentiator for Hackbrite is lots and lots of career services, right? You think about the boot camp, there's two purposes. You're coming to learn a new skill that's intellectually really challenging, and you're coming to get a new job. So we're there to support you in both endeavors. So um, our business model is two-sided. Women pay uh, tuition to come to Hackbrite, but then also companies pay to recruit from us. We have a unique pipeline of talent that's not picked over on LinkedIn and Indeed. These are net new engineers, all women, um, all trained with a curriculum that's been vetted by our partners. So they've bought into what we're teaching and why, and they've bought into the quality of the students we admit, and they're paying us a placement fee to hire from us. And then we in turn rebate a portion of that to the women to give them an incentive to This is partners. great, phenomenal work. Congratulations Thank on you. this. I'm so excited for you personally, as Thank well you. as the passion. And it's the right thing, it's so, so awesome. Um, I guess the, my final question for you would be, talk to the audience out there and other women, young women who see this as an inspirational opportunity for what you're doing. What can they learn from this? What can someone in high school, who's maybe a sophomore at Palo Alto Public School, 
for uh, someone who's not even in a, in, in a technical track or someone in college saying, hey, I, thought I might be in the wrong major at junior year. Right. What advice would you have for those people? Can I, can I add one little thing to that? Sure. As you do so, observe what types of new problems these tools and tactics and techniques and skills are going to be applied to. Because I think a big part of the issue is women may not see that the problems that are important to them right. tie back to these skills. Right. So, so first, big picture to go to your point. There's such an important need for diverse engineering teams because technology, as we talked about earlier, it's it's um, the layer through which we experience almost every kind of product now, right? Our car is a software product. Our, um, our home appliances are software products. And when you have a monoculture engineering team making the design and feature trade-offs for those things, you're often leaving out large parts of the market. So, And diverse teams just make better decisions, period. So it's really important to have a diverse engineering workforce in every sector in America. Um, I have a young, one of my daughters, the one who I mentioned went away to college, who is a liberal arts major. She, I could never get her interested in code. And then coming up on her senior year, she asked me, could she take a computer science class? And I said, sure, but why? Why? <laughs> why? Uh, you know, what changed your mind? And she said, it's like baking. It's a life skill everyone should have at this point in American history because, because of that fact that software is everywhere, right? Yeah. Um, in fact, we use so, terms, it's baking in the it's oven. baking, <laughs> yes. The code's not the code baked. baked. <laughs> yes. So, um, so I, I think um, the percentage of women in computer science went down precipitously starting in the 1980s with the rise of the personal computer and also the gaming console. And it became, coding as a culture became synonymous with gamers. And even, even my kids, you know, who grew up steeped in the software business, um, thought, of, thought of coders as, you know, guys in sweats in the basement in front of the Xbox. And that is just not true. So software is being used by lots and lots and built by lots of different kinds of people. So um, girls, young women, women um, should think there is a place for you in software. It's not, you, you know, you can belong in this environment. I think that, you know, many of us have the impression this, you know, there no ambient the sense of belonging. The right. kind of thing. Um, yeah. And so there's lots of ways to try it. And I would say try it and see if you like it. Um, whether it means, uh, you know, joining a club at school, um, joining girls, you know, girls who code, or there's new, there are numerous coding clubs for girls in middle school and high school. Well, and the important there's, thing is it's a life skill, as you pointed out. Right. And Women can be curious. My daughter's curious. She's in pre-med. She's studying out. Now she's starting to ask me the same questions. Maybe I should take a Python class. I'm like, why Python? Why not Swift? I'm like, so like, I love the, right. I love that conversation. Python. So, so, Python. We teach Python. It's the most prevalently taught in computer science programs. It's the most prevalently used in enterprise and data science uh, too. Yes. Great so for data science. it's. Um, you know, you can you can take free classes on Code Academy or Coursera. You just don't know what you're going to like, um, and I think so. Taste as, as much taste as you is, can, right? And also the ability to think like an engineer is useful, even if you don't choose to go into engineering. I mean, honestly, I have two engineering degrees. I never practiced engineering professionally, but I guarantee you that that skill set of being able to decompose a problem. Um, find the drivers and articulate what you know how what what the methodology is to get an outcome is incredibly useful a across multiple domains. Sharon, you're so impressive and so inspirational. And congratulations on your new mission. A lot of passion, mission-based yes. venture. It's scaling now. Uh, Absolutely. Congratulations. Thank you. Hack Bright Academy, Sharon Weinbar, CEO, and still venture partner at Scale VP. You're watching theCUBE live at Oracle Local World in San Francisco, extracting the signal noise. We'll be right back with more CUBE coverage after this.